Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kent Phillips, and I'm the Connections Minister here at Mount Gilead. Whether you are in the building or watching us online, we are so grateful that you're pursuing Jesus with us. It's my privilege today to celebrate with you the baptism of Isabella Miller and the decision of Justin and Michelle White and family to officially join the church as members. If you would like to learn more about baptism, membership, or just how you can take your next step in getting involved at Mount Gilead, I would encourage you to sign up for the next round of Starting Point that begins next week. You can sign up on the app or the church website. Now, let's all join together and worship God with one another today.
today, church. He is God of the promise. Amen. God, we know you're faithful. God, we trust you. We have this assurance that you love us. And we worship you today. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit. Washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the 
God, you are my story. You're my hope. You're my glory. You are worthy. Come on, let's just tell him our story. Let's just worship him for who he is. He's our assurance. He's our hope. He's our anchor in the storm, church. Yes, you are my story. Oh, you are my glory. Amen. Amen. He's our story. Amen. You can be seated today. At this time, we're going to continue to worship together through participation in communion with one another. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthian church, reminded them of the importance of communion by writing the following. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me is such a unique and powerful statement. To do something in someone's memory usually means to honor them by living out their morals or, or passions. So it's almost as if Jesus is asking us every time we approach the communion table to ask ourselves, am I living out Jesus's morals and passions in my life? In the gospels, Jesus said the son of man, referring to himself, came to seek and save that which is lost. He also said the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others. Today, as you take the bread and the cup in remembrance of Jesus, take a moment and reflect on whether you, like Jesus, are concerned with helping those who are far from God to find their way home, and are you focusing on how you can serve others? If you're like me, this might be a good moment to confess that far too often I live my life in remembrance of me and my priorities instead of Jesus and his priorities. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the grace of communion and the opportunity to continually remind ourselves that we have a mission to serve others and to love others the way that you did. Be with us as a church, unite us in this moment, turn our hearts to you and your vision and your mission. In Jesus name I pray, amen.
During this moment, we have the opportunity through giving to celebrate God's generosity by expressing our own generosity. I believe Jesus spoke so often about money because he knew how easy it is to put our value and security in our resources rather than our relationship with him. Every time we express generosity financially, we are making a statement that says, my security is not in the money I hold, but in the promises of God that hold me. Let's pray today that God will give us wisdom to use what he has entrusted to us as a church well. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in your generosity, to be able to use that which you have given us to pour into the church and the lives of those in need. God, give us wisdom today that we would use these resources well and that your kingdom would be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, Mount Gilead. Man, I am so grateful to be here with you. There is power in praise. There's power in prayer, and there is power in together. So I'm glad we're here together. I'm glad we're here together with those of you who are uh, online with us today. We are one month into our 2020 Tools for the Toolbox Times. And uh, of all the tools that we've talked about, None of them are helping me more than the one I want to talk about today. It's scripture. And in fact, none of the other tools will work well without this one. Uh, we started by talking about courage and faith. Faith comes from scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then we talked about humble self-awareness and that has to come from scripture, from comparing your own life to scripture. And then the next week we talked about godly discernment and that kind of wisdom and skill comes only from scripture. And then last week we spoke of prayer and fasting and that comes from and intersects with scripture. Even Jesus when he was tempted and he fasted for 40 days, correctly used Scripture. But when we pull this tool out of the box, we need to understand that, that Scripture is a tool that requires careful handling and proper use. Now, I know you've seen the funny warning stickers on products. Have you ever seen the warning stickers that come on some tools? If you bought a new chainsaw, would you need this warning sticker on it? That you grab the right end of the chainsaw? Or if you bought a new drill... Uh, for the shop, would you need this sticker? This is not to be used as a, a dental uh, tool. Or if you bought a new nail gun, would you need to know that 68% that of all injuries uh, happen to the workers who use the nail guns? I don't know who else the, uh, the injuries would happen to, but I do know this. I know that scripture is a tool that requires proper handling and proper use. In fact, I don't know if you realize this or not, but scripture is a tool that comes with some warning labels, like Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that uh, shatters the rock? Or if you're thinking New Testament, you might go to Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God's a sword. It's alive and powerful. It pierces to divide in the sunder of soul and spirit. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Warning labels on scripture because scripture's a sword. It's a mirror that we see ourselves in. It's a scalpel. It's a hammer. It's a nail. It's seed. It's a brilliant light. It's like a boomerang. It's sharp. It's powerful. It's effective. It's offensive. It's destructive. It's overpowering. It's, it's dangerous. It's demanding. It's like a fire. It's alive. 
And we need this tool in our toolbox, but we need to know how to use it correctly. Now, some of you have heard me lay this out before, to take the word exegesis. When you see the word exegesis, that's a good word. Exegesis means to take a passage of scripture and determine the author's intended meaning. We exegete a passage of scripture, we call that exegesis, and we look for the author's intended meaning. That's a good thing. But some people do a thing called eisegesis. In fact, we've all been guilty of it. And that's when we look at a scripture and we read our own meaning into the scripture. So exegesis is good and eisegesis is bad. And then somebody else coined the term narcegesis. That's when you read a passage of scripture and you make it all about you. And I coined a new word myself this week. I call it apologesis. And that's when you read your politics into the passage of scripture. That's not good either. And then there's help me Jesus. And that's what all of us need to pray when we open up the the Word of God. Now, the text I've chosen today uh, about this tool from the toolbox is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Some of you might recognize it. Here's what it says. It says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the Word of truth. Do you see that? Accurately handling the word of truth. So right off the bat, we find something out here that when we use this tool of scripture, it's more than just an academic tool. Now, when I was a child, I learned this famous verse, 2 Timothy 2.15. I learned it in the King James Version. When you read it from the King James Version, this is what it says. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so the verse started out with that word, study. And to most of us, that word study primarily carries an academic, student, uh, homework, book learning, knowledge kind of approach. And certainly that's one aspect of being approved to God and handling scripture correctly. But in 1611, when the King James Version was uh, translated, this word study, spudazzo, was a much broader, richer word. It meant more than to just sit down with a pile of books. It meant to do your best, to be diligent, to labor over. So the original intent of this verse was urging Timothy to give all of his attention and all of his ambition and all of his desire to pleasing God. And of course, a big part of doing that was the accurate handling of this tool we call Scripture. So the implications of this verse as we begin uh, are also about application, not just academia. They're not just about orthodoxy, they're about orthopraxy. In other words, uh, not just right doctrine, but right doing. Not just right learning, but right living. Not just right positions, but right practice. And none of these can happen optimally without the accurate handling of Scripture or as the King James Version says, rightly dividing the word of truth. So just understand as we begin, this is more than just an academic tool when we talk about the Bible. It's more than just holing up with a pile of study books, although sometimes that's the right thing to do. Not only is it more than an academic tool, it's more than a debate tool. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Look at the verse that immediately precedes our text in verse 15. And if you're a math genius, then you know that's verse 14, right? It says, remind them of these things, solemnly charge them in the presence of God, not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Now that's the verse that immediately precedes the text. Look at the one that immediately follows the text. That's verse 16. It says, avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. Now, did you know there are numerous scriptures like this? For instance, the same author, Paul, wrote to a preacher named Titus in chapter 3 and verse 9, and he said, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law. They're unprofitable and worthless. It almost makes me think the apostle Paul must have spent a little bit of time on Facebook and Twitter. In other words, this this book, the Word of God, it's more than just an academic tool. It's also more than just a debate tool. 
just finding a place to back up your positions. Now, let me uh, be quick to say that there is definitely a time and a place to debate and defend Scripture. In fact, Jesus and his disciples did it all the time. And one could say that most of the books of our New Testament were written at least in part to correct doctrinal error. And so it's simply not fair to refuse to discuss disagreements and to not allow your positions to be questioned under the guise of never debating. But this book is more than just a debate tool. The 2 Timothy 3, 16, which may be one of the most famous passages about the Bible in the Bible, says, all scripture is inspired by God, God breathed, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. So there are times to debate scripture, but this is more than just a debate tool. Dialogue and debate can help us discern the truth, but even necessary debating and conflict is not the sole purpose of scripture. It's more than a debate tool. It's also more than a self-justification tool. Now, our text, just one little verse here says that scripture is to be rightly divided or handled accurately. In other words, scripture is capable of being abused and misused. And so many of us use scripture as an attempt at self-justification or what I would call a, a personal opinion backup. And when we do that, we can do harm in the process to ourselves and to others and to the integrity of the interpretation of Scripture. Now, I want to give you some examples of this. Maybe you've heard some of the same things I've heard uh, recently. Things like this. Well, Jesus never owned property, and he always shared, so he believed in socialism. Or how about this one? Jesus respected private ownership and possessions, therefore Jesus was an avowed capitalist. Jesus told the disciples to go and buy themselves a sword, so I am sure that he would support gun ownership. Or on the other side of the coin, Jesus did not defend himself, so he is against all forms of self-defense. Jesus fled to Egypt in his infancy with his parents, so Jesus was an immigrant. Jesus didn't specifically name abortion or homosexuality, so he must approve them. Or here's one of my favorites. Jesus died for you. You can wear a mask for him, or at least for others. Or on the other side of the coin, Jesus died to make us free, and I'm not giving up my freedom by wearing a mask. See, we, we use Scripture to justify our positions, and what's important when we rightly handle the word of truth is not just where we end up, but how we get there. In other words, do we handle Scripture accurately? It's not my place to talk about any of those opinions today. What, what I'm talking about today is whether or not we accurately handle Scripture. And it's not just Jesus that we hijack. We do it with other voices in Scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, Peter says, as also in all his letters, talking about Paul's letters, speaking in them uh, of these things in which are some things hard to understand. Doesn't that make you feel better that an apostle, Peter, said there's some stuff in the Bible that is hard to understand? Man, that makes me feel better. He says some of the stuff Paul wrote is hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. It's possible to distort what God says in scripture. According to our text, uh, we should care not so much about justifying ourselves, but we should care about being approved to God. Do your diligence to be approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In fact, I had a teacher one time tell me that the only degree that, is, that really matters is what he called your AUG degree, approved unto God. Now, the, using scripture correctly as a tool is a, is a wonderful thing. 
Earlier uh, this week, my uh, scripture reading for the day just happened to be in the book of Romans. And I don't just read the scripture, I listen to it. And so one day I listened to Romans 12, Romans 13, Romans 14, Romans 15, and Romans 16. And Romans chapter 12 talked about renewing your mind, not being conformed to this world and a loving approach and a rejection of personal revenge. And then Romans 13 talked about submitting to the government and holy sober uh, behavior. And, And then Romans 14 talked about our opinions and our practices and our liberties in balance with other people's well-being. And then Romans 15 talks about self-denial on behalf of others and hope and joy and peace and the power of the Holy Spirit and sharing the gospel. And Romans 16 is all about people, 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 and love and grace and relationship and unity. And it struck me that day as I listened to those uh, five chapters that there wasn't a single one of those chapters that wasn't speaking to the situations we find ourselves in right now in 2020. Scripture is so much more than just an academic tool. And it's so much more than just a debate tool. And it is so much more than just a self-justification tool. And yet the command remains, study, do your diligence to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing, handling accurately the word of truth. So I want to take a few moments uh, in the time that remains to talk to you about handling scripture accurately. Now, one commentator suggests that since Paul, who wrote this, is a tent maker, he may have been using an expression that tied in with his trade because when Paul made tents, he used certain uh, patterns. In those uh, days, tents were made of uh, animal skins in a patchwork sort of design, and every piece would have to be uh, cut, fit together properly. And if you don't cut the pieces right, then the whole won't fit together properly. And it's the same thing with scripture. If you don't interpret correctly the different parts, the whole message won't come through correctly. Now, maybe some of you know this. Maybe you're familiar with this word. Maybe you're not. I'm going to not talk a lot about the word itself. But there is an entire legitimate field of study called hermeneutics. And, and hermeneutics is really simply learning fair and proper ways to interpret scripture and how to avoid misunderstanding or interpretation mistakes. And so one of the first things we have to learn, whether we know the word hermeneutics or not, is proper rules of interpreting Scripture so we don't make mistakes when we read Scripture. There's a satirical spoof going around on social media that appropriately exposes how unbiblical truth is being, how biblical truth is being abused in our culture. L- listen to this. Have you ever wanted to become a biblical scholar but without the hassle of study or ancient languages or becoming familiar with the ancient world? Well, you're in luck because here at the University of Facebook School of Biblical Studies, our motto is anyone can be a biblical scholar. Our most popular courses include, that's not what my Bible says, And the Holy Spirit told me, you're wrong. Don't like reading? That's no problem. All you need to succeed in our program is an internet connection, access to YouTube, and some strong opinions and some memes. Owning a Bible helps, but it's not required. Enroll now and start your career today. Now, don't get me wrong. God didn't give scripture to us in such a way that only professional scholars can understand it. But he does expect all of us to make an attempt to learn to use it properly. And that includes scripture reading and scripture arranging and scripture interpreting and scripture understanding and scripture application and scripture saturation and meditation and obedience and filtering and pondering and meditating and memorizing and internalizing. Now, we might not use the word hermeneutics in our everyday life when it comes to learning how to interpret scripture, but let me just put some common offenses out there for you. These are common mistakes people make when they try to handle uh, scripture, and I'll just, I made up some new names for it, all right? Instead of uh, some some hermeneutical term, we'll just give, let me give them these new names. First one's just called cherry picking. And cherry picking is like a a spouse who practices uh, selective listening. Uh, there's a few here who do that. So cherry picking is where you just 
pick out one little piece of the Bible that you want because it backs up what you think or what you need. It's convenient for you at the moment. So somebody might go to the book of Matthew and say, well, judge not that you be not judged and totally miss the next few verses for in the same manner that you judge, that's the way you'll be judged. And Jesus even saying in the same chapter further on, you'll know them by your fruits. But we just cherry pick the part that we want. The, the second mistake we make, I'll just call context skipping. That's where you fail to ask questions from the text. You don't ask, when was this written? Where was it written? Why was it written? To whom was it written? Uh, who wrote it? I'll give you an example how we do this, and I don't want to bust anybody's bubble here, and we don't really do any harm when we do it in this particular instance, but we take scriptures like Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to, to prosper you and not to harm you. And we just grab that, appropriate it for ourselves, and even though our conclusions might be true, we fail to realize that that was, verse was written to a specific group of people in a specific time in the Old Testament, and we, we skip the whole context when we interpret it. Uh, third mistake we make, I just call it mail stealing. You ever had somebody come along, open your mailbox, steal mail out of the mailbox? Uh, scripture was written to an original audience and we have to understand the application to them first before we make the application to ourselves. And so there may be times, for instance, where Jesus made a promise to the apostles that was specifically just to the 12 apostles, but it's not a promise that was made to all of us. For instance, he once said to the disciples, there are some of you standing here who will not taste death until the kingdom of God comes with power. He was talking to them. And we're going to misinterpret that if we don't take the time to realize that the book of Philippians, for instance, was first written to Christians at Philippi. And the book of First and Second Corinthians was first written to the church at Corinth. And so we have to be careful. We're not just stealing somebody else's mail, even though scripture is also intended for all of us as well. Uh, let me just give you one more. There are plenty more than these, but uh, I, I just call it image missing. We miss the figures of speech and the images that are used in, in the Bible. Things like hyperbole, exaggeration, a contrast, figurative language. What do I do when I'm reading along in the New Testament? It said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If, if your hand offends you, cut it off. Or how about this one? Some of you really like this verse. It says, uh, bodily exercise is of little value. Oh, yeah. Bodily exercise is of little value, but godliness is profitable for all things, for the life that now is and the life that is to come. He's not saying there's no value in physical exercise. He's saying when you compare it to godliness, guess what the priority is? Or he says to women, uh, don't let your dress, your adornment be uh, gold and silver and makeup and dresses. Instead, let it be the hidden person of the heart. What if I come along and say, look at that, the Bible says don't wear makeup. The Bible says don't wear golden jewelry. The Bible says don't wear dresses. No, he's making a contrast. What you are on the inside is more important than what you are on the outside. And if we don't understand those figures of speech and those images that are used in the Bible, we're going to end up in the wrong place because we're not handling accurately the word of truth. In fact, my dad used to tell me, you could show from the Bible that it is a sin to peel a banana. What God has joined together, let not man put us under. That's what the scripture says. So we want to handle uh, scripture accurately. So what we're going to do, and we're going to just fly through this, just a quick eavesdropping moment on watching people in the Bible mishandle truth in scripture, and then seeing Jesus handle it correctly. And I'll just warn you ahead of time, I'm not going to make comments about this. We're not going to get bogged down in, in our own questions about the subjects that they bring up and that Jesus brings up. I just want to show you how Jesus does it. And all of it's found right in the same chapter in Matthew 22. The Pharisees, verse 15, went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you're truthful and you teach the way of God in truth and you defer to no one and you're, you're not partial to any. So tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful 
to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and he said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius and he said to them, whose likeness and inscriptions on there? In other words, whose pictures on this coin? And they said to him, Caesar's. He said, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. I'm brilliant. And hearing this, they were amazed and leaving him, they went away. See, what we have to understand when we're interpreting scripture is there are some people who are just looking for ways to discredit and they're going to refuse to believe no matter what. So we just stick to the principles of truth. But the confrontation continues in verse 23. On that day, some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and they questioned him saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother is next of kin, shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us and the first married and died and having no children, left his wife to his brother and so also the second and the third down to the seventh and last of all, the woman died. And in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of those seven shall she be? For they had all married her. Don't you love how people come up with hypothetical situations and theological arguments? Jesus answered and said to them, you're mistaken. Not understanding the scripture or the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Now, I know you'd like to get bogged down in all the details of that, but look at Jesus. He knows that some people don't know the scripture, so he points to accurate interpretation and application rules of the scripture but they still haven't learned their lesson. Verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your, all your soul and all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. There will always be some people who challenge our knowledge, but we need to know what's essential. We need to keep driving back to the basics. One more thing. Verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? He said, whose son is he? They said, son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David calls him Lord, then how then is he his son? (laughs) And no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day to ask him another question. See, there will always be people who believe false ideas, but you can ask questions to reach the truth. Now, I know I blew blew through that kind of fast, but this is such a dangerous time that we live in. And, And I say that not so much because of a coronavirus or a job loss or riots or racial mistreatment or who's going to get elected or who's not going to get elected next president. I say these are dangerous times because of the widespread distortion and the abandonment of truth, the passionate spewing of ideas without knowledge, the rampant regurgitation of narratives without verification, and the continual erosion of moral absolutes. And when truth is lost, the foundation crumbles and anything goes. Decades ago, Francis Schaeffer warned us, if there are no absolutes by which to judge society, then the society itself is absolute. Here's a scenario, according to Scott McKay, that is uh, sadly a lot less implausible than it ought to be. He says, let's say there are 99 mathematicians who get together and agree that 2 plus 2 equals 5. And then let's say there's a guy from a construction crew who in response starts stacking bricks in little 2 by 2 piles to prove that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Who has the better argument? And McKay says, perhaps it's always been true that common sense wins out over collective expertise of the elites and it's probably never been more true than right now. In a relativistic culture to each his own and that puts all of us in danger of one another. 
It's like the Old Testament book of Judges all over again where it says in those days there was no king in Israel so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And if you remember the horrors of the book of Judges, you know how tragically that ends. There's a verse in the book of Proverbs that just been playing through my mind recently. Proverbs 18, 17. It says, the first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. Anybody here resonate with that besides me? Well, hear that, it sounds right. But then somebody else comes and says the opposite. That sounds right too. And who's your authority? Who are you listening to? And after you listen, what do you believe? And here's what I'm saying today. It's not just important what you believe. It's important how you get there, how you use scripture to get there. Do your diligence to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. And it's not important just how you got there. It's also important how you hold that truth and civility and love and compassion and maturity and how you live it out with consistency and integrity. Psalm 119 is all about the word of God. And this morning I just yanked a couple of verses from there. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed. Open my eyes. That I may behold wonderful things from your law. Your testimonies are my delight. They are also my counselors. And my, my soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. I cling to your testimonies, O God. Do not put me to shame. The arrogant utterly deride me, yet I do not turn aside from your law. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. I rise before dawn and I 